Thanks, Ria. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, now for the most awaited session of the day. Uh, other than the four to five questioning you have uh, for our fund managers, of course, I'm sure most of you are waiting for that. But uh, several of you have written that uh, you're looking forward to this session. Uh, it's indeed a, a special guest uh, who no, needs no introduction. And he's sort of modestly asked me to keep it short. Uh, that helps, because there's nothing much to introduce. Uh, you know enough. But what I'll do is I'll just throw context to why uh, he's a relevant speaker for all of us this afternoon. Uh, the three aspects to, uh, as we fondly call him, MDP Sir's uh, background. One is he was part of the build out of perhaps India's most iconic company, Infosys, which stood for governance. And as many of you know, governance is the core of our philosophy. So there's much uh, that we've learned from him. Uh, I'm sure he can share uh, governance in companies uh, from his experience. Uh, second, he sits on uh, several committees driving regulatory change in the country for the better governance at the country level itself. And third, many of you may not know, he's a prolific investor in Startup India, which is the most exciting space. Um, so he can bring all these together to tell us uh, the India story like nobody else can. Uh, and as many of us follow him on social media, uh, he speaks his mind. Uh, he wears his heart on his sleeve. Um, so without much ado, I invite MDP sir uh, on stage uh, and Saurabh as well. Thank you. So, um, so last time MDP and I did a similar chat, it was in his hometown, Bangalore. And we sort of looked back at India. Um, and MDP did something very useful. He used Amita Bachchan movies analogy to explain what it felt like in the 70s, how the angry young man, the angry young man was born. And then we did a sort of, we did a little bit of time travel in Bangalore. Uh, uh, we went through the 80s, 90s and, and he bought, he, yeah, I think we, we stopped the discussion around 2015, 16. So MDP just to take that discussion forward, where do we stand now as a country? Where do you think we have reached as a nation in 2023? Uh, sort of, we need to understand a little bit of history to know where we're going in the next few years. In 1950, we were the richest country in Asia because China was destroyed in the war, Southeast Asia was destroyed, Japan was destroyed, and we had 1.5 billion pounds due from Great Britain for the war effort. Out of the five richest families in Asia, three were Indian. And we are a well-developed infrastructure because we participate in the war, etc with the most accomplished army in uh, Asia. And then our first prime minister, being to Harrow and Cambridge and part of the Fabian School, brought in price controls in the 47, 48. He brought in license quota Raj in this country. Throughout history, India has been a rich country till 1750. 1750, China, India made up 45% of world GDP. Either we were number one or China was number one, primarily because we had rich soil and water in this country. We are the largest quantum of arable land in India today. And undivided India had maybe 50, 60% more in uh, Bengal and in the Punjab and Sindh. And uh, we were rich. And we had highly skilled artisans and people in this country who produced goods for exports. Pliny the Elder wrote 2,000 years ago that trade with India will empower its Rome because India sends spices and textiles to Rome and Rome had to pay India in gold. And to pay in gold, they had to loot many other countries. Right? So they drain out, right? We use our labor and they had to drain out all the gold from their empire. So it is a rich country and that's why the West came here. You know, we are invasions and we are impoverished. Now, 50 Pandit Nehru in his wisdom brought in socialism with the dream that we're going to become a socialistic paradise because post-war, that was the globally dominant philosophy because they said Soviet Russia has done well, blah, blah, blah. We've been colonized by Great Britain and we can't go back. We must shut out the foreigner and everything else. But he suppressed Indian private capital. He built a few IITs, did some few things. It was all great. You know, you know much of it is myth-making. You should know that 75% of people in the IITs went abroad. Okay? 
and for every IIT graduate, 100 young children paid with their lives because they did not get primary education and primary health. When Mao took over in 1949, he made a statement, women hold up half of heaven. You educated China's women. Chinese literacy rate is today 96. Ours is about 77. Men are 84, women are 65. We're not invested in a woman. No country can prosper unless his women are educated and you have primary health. And all data proves that educated woman has lesser children. And now if you look at a population, we are 1.42 billion. We don't have to be 1.42 billion if educated a woman in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And it could be done through our villages and through social action rather than government putting money, but he centralized it. He was the sort of intellectual who said that, you know, I can decide for everybody. I'm the brightest guy. I went to Cambridge, blah, blah, blah. And that was the dominant opinion there. So he suppressed. So what happened in growth? 1950 to 80, we grew at 3.5% because Idira carried his policies in a much more uh, you know, stringent way. Uh, population grew at 2.5%. Per capita income grew 1% a year. GDP, I think, in 1950 was $50 billion or so, right? And if you look at the rupee dollar rate, you'll find out that India was a you know, strong currency, right? But in 1980, and it's all due to the socialistic policies, controlled Raj, and Gandhi said, this desh mein sarkar vyapari hai, us desh mein janta bikari hai. We became bikaris. In 1980, we were among the poorest countries in Asia compared to 1950 because the world grew at 4.5% during the time. Asia grew at 6.5%. Germany came up, Asia came up, Southeast Asia came up. 1980, we opened up. We grew from 5.5% year from 1980 to 1990. And uh, population grew at about, uh, I'm sorry, population grew at about 2.25%. And, uh, you know, income grew 3.25%. But our debt in dollars went up from 20 billion to 80 billion. So we had a foreign exchange crisis in 91, and we opened up in 91. When we opened up in 91, March 31st, our GDP was 275 billion. Today, March 23, GDP is 3.49 trillion. We have grown 8.2% a year in dollar terms for 32 years. Please understand, 8.2% a year in dollar terms for 32 years. And the reason is very clear. We got back our economic freedom. We got political freedom in 47. We got economic freedom in uh, 1991, even though the license quota Raj is still there in a different way. And I think it's very important to understand this concept, why we need economic freedom. And the genius of the Indian people created this massive wealth. And also, we need to uh, remember that the only country which has grown faster during the time was China, grew at 9.9 or 10% for 40 years. They opened up in 78. And what did China do? China said, we have got surplus labor, so had a CZ policy. They got in industry, put those young girls into factories working 12 hours a day, six days a week, and they created surpluses and wealth. And then they also opened up agriculture. And they told the farmer, you can produce what you want. Farm income and per output doubled in 10 years. Then they had the SEZ. Factories came in. And then they created surpluses. They used that to develop infrastructure and the ports, because the whole district was a you know, uh, SEZ. And then they started investing in university education. China has got 1,000 universities, maybe 35 million young people in college. And they said, we want to have maybe 200 uh, institutions like the IITs. Then China started investing in, um, you know, high-tech industries. So China has become the factory of the world. 24, 25% of global manufacturing happens in China. They build a fantastic logistic hub, fantastic infrastructure, 25,000 kilometers of high-speed rail and is a $20 trillion economy, all right? So we have opened up, and I think we're doing well. And if you look forward, we could be a $5 trillion economy by 2026. This year end, we should be 3.75 trillion. And throughout this many years, our problem has been the rupee depreciating. Mm. Why did the rupee depreciate? The rupee depreciates because we have a trade deficit in goods. Last year, I think we had a trade deficit of 270 billion. I think Neelkan Mishra wrote an article, very nice. And we have a surplus on services of 198 billion. Surplus on services. And it says in three years, the surplus in services go up to 275 billion. And we're able to ramp up our manufacturing. We could have a surplus in service equal to a deficit in goods and balance out. And that means the currency will be more balanced. We don't have to depend on foreign inflows to have, uh, you know, reserves. We have $600 billion of reserves. So the economy has undergone deep shifts. We get $100 billion of remittances every year. 
We export $200 billion of software. $135 billion of cash comes in through software. We have 5.5 million people in the software. We hired 500,000 people the year before, the largest in the industry. Of the top 10 software service companies of market value, five are Indian. Of the top five, three are Indian. Of the 3.2 million employees in the top 10, 2.3 million are Indians. United States has 6 million software people, 1 million are Indians. Of the 5.5 million, 3 million work for American companies. Of the 10 million working for American companies globally, 4 million are Indians. So we dominate this sector with 60% of global outsourcing come here. So the future of technology will be United States, China, and India. China has got the you know, Chinese firewall. So India and the United States are very close together. You know, Bangalore has got 300,000 chip designers, testers, and embedded software people, the largest collection of semiconductor chip designers in the world, with over 300 companies working there, largely American. So in human capital, we've done very well because of liberalization and in services. Now, can we grow to 5 trillion by 2026, yes. We can go to 5 trillion, provide that rupee repents at 82, because that is the key. We have grown in from uh, GDP from 525 lakh crores to 272 lakh crores between 91 to 2023, uh, and this year we expected to go as per the budget to 302 lakh crores. It, it's very large, all right? And we invest 31% of GDP in CapEx. I read the stupid reports in the media, CapEx growth is coming down, this is coming down. I mean, how can you be stupid? Look at the Mosby report. We save 30% of GDP, invest 31.5% of GDP, 31.5% of gross uh, investment is $1 trillion. Only the United States possibly and China invest equal in $1 trillion. China has much more in CapEx. So we are investing hugely. We are seeing this growth. So we, I think by 2020 it will be, year end will be 3.75 trillion. And today Japan is about 4.25 trillion, I think. Germany is 4.1 trillion. So to overtaking them is not going to be difficult. We will overtake them. We will grow at 6.5% this year. And next year too, we could grow maybe 6, 6.5% because the investing, consumption is going up, etc. And by 2032, 2034, we could be $10 trillion. So why am I optimistic? I've seen the rise of a great country from 91. I've seen the rise of a great industry, the software industry, which changed everything. I've seen the rise of a great company like Infosys. I'm very, very optimistic. And that's why, if you look at everything, India has transformed. Our banking system is in very good shape. Our industry has got less debt. Last year, total corporate tax collection was 10 lakh 4,000 crores before refunds. Okay? Assuming a 25% tax rate, that's 40 lakh crores pre-tax profits. That's the amount of money people are making. And on a GDP of 272 lakh crores, that is 15% of GDP is pre-tax corporate profits. We have great companies, they're raising money, they become efficient, and our capital output ratio, I call it, is about 4.1, 4.2, and that is pretty good. If you look at all this, you have to be optimistic. And consumption will go up. We are poor. We have only $2,500. But when you look at India, we've got to be very careful about data because, you know, on social media, people, you know, abuse India. Just the other day, some, uh, some, I don't want to use the bad word for the guy. The guy's an idiot. You know, he said, oh, India shut down the internet 84 times, the largest in the world, and Ukraine did it 22 times. I say, man, we are 1.42 billion. Out of 84, 45 times is Kashmir, where we got terrorism. Ukraine is just about 40 million. Now there must be 30 million. They lost people. How can you compare a small country with a large country and say, oh, we are the worst in the world. We are this in the world. These are nuts. I mean, I get angry. None of them have done anything to grow this country. None of them have done anything to grow this country. We have to grow this country. We have to give good things to our people. Every Indian should have the necessities of life. And let me make a statement. I like Prime Minister Modi for a very important reason. He has tackled the biggest challenge India has, the deprivation of our people. He has made sure in 10 years, every Indian has a roof over the head, water in the tap, power in the switch, a toilet in the house, a gas stove, a bank account, money in the bank, an internet connection, a mobile connection, and food on the table, and education for children, and health insurance. If every Indian gets that, a large number of Indians get that, they'll be very different people. They will not fight for survival. They'll want to work. They want to educate. And when these people come up, out of 1.4 billion people, I believe 1 billion people earn $1,000 a year. That's one trillion. 400 million earn about $6,000 a year. That's 2.4 trillion. That's 3.4 trillion, right? Out of 400 million, the 100 million earn $10,000 a year. And the balance earn $5,000 a year. It is 10, 100 million who buy the cars. 5.2 million four wheelers last year. 19 million uh, two wheelers last year. They're the ones who buy the houses. 
They are the ones who go on holidays. They are the ones who fly. 100 million is fantastic. A $10,000, a middle income country, bigger than most countries in the world. 100 million people. And if you take the PPP, GDP is 3.49 trillion and the PPP is 12.2 trillion. Our PPP multiple is 3.6, 3.7. That means there should be $35,000 on PPP for the top 100 million people. They're the ones who will invest in you. They're in Bombay, they're in Bangalore, they're in Delhi, they're in Pune, in Hyderabad, and the rest of them, forget it. And UP may come up a little bit, but the rest of them, you know, even if you ignore it, it doesn't matter. Because this is a consuming class. Yes. And consumption drives 70% of GDP, investment is 30% of GDP. So if you look at all this data, you have to be optimistic. Yeah. And let me tell you before, uh, you know, you ask me the next question. Anyway, I'll talk about what are the global growth drivers when you ask me the question. So, so I was just going to come to the, the growth drivers, but a little bit of a factoid just to... So, Pramod, please just sign up as many people as possible uh, uh, <laughs> by the time we are done. And, and you, you must tell me this, market cap and GDP have a correlation, right? You know, we normally be, today I think market cap is 3.5 trillion? 4 trillion almost. Yeah. Oh, 4 trillion, right? America is 26 trillion GDP, market cap is 43, 44, right? So we are a little bit ahead because we got growth. So as the economy growth, market cap will grow. If the market cap goes to 10 trillion by 20, 32, 34, your investors make a lot of money. So, thank you. <laughs> so, just on how much money investors can make, a little bit of background. And, and I think one of the reasons we, we, we love not just listening to MDP, he, he, his inputs have been critical in shaping Marcellus, is he's able to help you see the country not through the usual narrative. The usual narrative is we're a poor country, we should know our place in the world, we should behave at our, you know, whatever poor countries do, we should do st stuff like that. MDP takes a different point of view and the data backs him. So I'll show you, I'll t explain to you one way in which the data validates what MDP is saying. So if you look at the whole world, take the whole world, take all the emerging markets, every single emerging market. And you say you're an investor, you're happy to invest anywhere in the world. You're American FII, right? Uh, you don't care whether the returns are Chinese or Indian, return to return hota hai. And, and you say I have, the American investor says I have one simple criteria. I want to invest in companies who for 10 consecutive years can grow at 10%, top line growth 10% and return on equity should also be minimum 10%. So 10, 10, 10, minimum 10 years of 10% revenue growth and 10% ROE. If you look around the world, there's only two countries who have more than a dozen companies who make that cut. So let's call these companies consistent compounders, 10, 10, 10. 10 years of 10% ROE and 10% revenue growth. Um, so you know, countries like Korea, Taiwan have five to six such companies. Brazil has two, I think, right? The only two countries who have uh, uh, more than a dozen such companies are China and India. China has around 160 such companies. India has 120, right? We have one-fifth China's GDP. We have one-fifth China's GDP, but we have 120 companies who over the last 20 years, in any given 10-year cycle, have done this 10-10-10 business, right? Now, here comes the, the really interesting part. The Chinese 150 consistent compounders have compounded in dollar terms at 12% over the last 20 years. 12% dollar compounding, right? Marginally ahead of the Chinese stock market. The Indian consistent compounders have compounded over the last 20 years at 22% dollar compounding, right? So that means every three years, whoever, global investor, Indian investor, whoever had got associated with the consistent compounders over the last 20 years, every three years, their wealth broadly has, has doubled, right? Now, this, this, this sort of narrative, we, are, we dredge out from the financial numbers. Because of MDP's depth of experience, he sees this in the real world, courtesy his experience in Bangalore and and, 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 and in Infosys. So sir, just turning back now to the whole China-India thing, there's a lot of excitement about China plus one, right? Yeah, around in, in Bangalore, Hosur, around Chennai, in the uh, pharma belt in Hyderabad, there's a lot of expectation that mobile phones, uh, laptops, air conditioners, API, we will be making all this stuff. You have seen many false dawns before. Is this another false dawn MDP or is this a real dawn? No, I think the the diversification away from China is real for political risks, political reasons and political risk. Because what China did in the COVID clampdown was terrible. They just shut down, didn't bother about anybody else. Right. And that shook the world. Then the world realized 
that China sh shuts down, 25% of manufacturing is over, the world will suffer. They're being held hostage. So the American greed for dollars was overtaken by the American fear of China. Now the narrative in America is China is the big enemy, not uh, Russia. So you must listen to Vivek Ramaswamy talking about the uh, American elections. And he's saying the biggest threat to America is Russia and China being together. And we've got to break that. It's not Russia. Putin is very weak economically. He's got some 8,000, 9,000 nukes. He can build the world over. But, you know, if he, he, he blows the world over, he's going to be blown. And he loves his life and his dashas and all that nice stuff, right? So China is a big threat. So there's a movement away from China. What is happening is much of Chinese manufacturing is contract manufacturing. The big global brands get it done through Chinese company. They're moving to Vietnam. Vietnam has a 1,200 kilometer border with China, and they're all shifting there. And yesterday I read an article that Vietnamese manufacturing is down and export is down because China's export is down. But the world is not buying much more stuff. I mean, it's come down. So that is there. Some 10, 15% is coming to India. Much of it is going out. So what has happened today, Saurabh, is that manufacturing has become automated. Robotics and automation has taken over. For example, if you look at uh, you know, Foxconn, Foxconn had 12 lakh young girls assembling Apple phones. And they were working 12 hours a day, six days a week, staying in hostels next to the factory. Very efficient operation. Then two, three years back, the girls started going to the boss and saying, we want a salary raise. They said, what is the salary raise? We want more money. Because Chinese wages have gone up 3x in the last seven to eight years. Okay. So they started replacing them by robots. Every year, 50,000 girls are being re replaced by robots. So most manufacturing has become automated because robots have got dexterity in their tips. Manufacturing, see, assembly requires dexterity. Okay, they got dexterity because of good manufacturing practices, and the cost of a robo has come down to 30% what it was 10 years ago. So much of manufacturing will become automated. Now, when manufacturing has become automated, you can shift the factory because the investment will be in assets and robots. Investment in labor will be less. The labor component of manufacturing comes down. And that says you don't have to go to a labor-intensive industry where labor costs are very low to be competitive. So, for example, Adidas shoes has gone away from China. They're using uh, 3D printing to make shoe soles. They can design a new shoe in 15 days against uh, two months. And uh, they can design it in Bangalore, and they can set up 3D printing machines in 10 countries in Europe, press a button, and the shoes will be printed out and delivered. No supply chain, no coming from there, no coming from here. So that's the kind of automation that's happened. We went to the Tesla factory, fully run by robots. And there's a video on YouTube for Mercedes-Benz about manufacturing cars, you must see this unbelievable, the level of automation, the level of flexibility, everything that's come because of automation, driven entirely by software. When that happens, what is the cost? The cost is robotics, same cost everywhere. Land and building, maybe different. Labor, supervision, that's the high cost. Software, that's the high cost. And that cost could be the same everywhere else. Right? So it changes the way manufacturing takes place. And China's labor cost has gone up 3x. That means the Chinese have stopped subsidizing the world. You see, for the last 30 years, manufacturing around the world suffered because the Chinese labor, 650 million people working in China at low wages, suppress wages, suppress the manufacturing costs, and they subsidize the West. They created $4 trillion of surpluses. Now that is going. Politically, because China is seen as a threat, and otherwise, too, because China is becoming expensive. And I'll give you a small piece of data which Sajan Jindal spoke out. He said, China makes 1.2 billion tons of steel. They earn 2 to 3% operating margin. I'm not sure he said that. Indians make 125 million, 10 to 15% operating margin. So Chinese philosophy was always scale, export, lower the cost, 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 cost. That's a differentiation, not a brand. The Western is brand, brand, brand. They sell a $25 stuff for $100 and make you feel happy, where the Chinese will sell a $100 stuff for $25 and, you know, try to get more revenue, right? Now, that is put on his head because of many reasons, one of which is China's working age population is coming down. You'll be very surprised, and I'm going to talk about it if you ask me the right question, that uh, the number of working age is coming down and is already down by 10% compared to 10 years ago. And last year, the Chinese population shrank in absolute numbers by 0.43%. Shrank. They've only produced 9.6 million babies or 10 million babies. India still produces 2.5 uh, crore babies a year for the last 30 years. And now this decade will start coming down. You know, because, you know, many other reasons happening. If you look at the population pyramid, the number 0 to 4 is lesser 
then uh, 4 to 10. And the data is there in a very nice report. I'll send it to you if you want. So these things are shifting everything. So I think it's real. Will it come on dramatically? No. But is it bleeding? Yes. And it will come down more and more as you go around. The biggest thing is uh, robotics, automation, geopolitical shifts, and uh, logistic cost. During COVID, one container cost $8,000 from United States to San Francisco. Now it's come down to $1,000. Earlier it was $1,000. And that showed people is very expensive. So logistic cost. So you're trying to take the risk out of business. And now automation allows you to create uh, this kind of uh, factories all over. Rohan, can you ask the right question? <laughs> <laughs> now I'm sure I'm still, uh, you know, my brain is uh, worrying with all the numbers that MDP threw out. Uh, I don't know how he stores it and retrieves it at the right time. But just... Uh, just extending uh, the point about automation, I'm sure a lot of uh, our audience will also have that question. We keep talking about the demographic dividend for India. Uh, it works out as being a very attractive market. But the flip side of that is in terms of job creation. Um, it's also a bit of an anomaly because when we speak to some of our portfolio companies, on the one hand, they talk about labor shortage. On the other hand, you are seeing automation trends, uh, and also we have, what, 10 million people entering the job market every day, uh, every year. Uh, how do you go about first creating jobs, and how do you explain this anomaly that parts of the country are seeing labor shortage, parts of the country are seeing job shortage? Now, let me talk about something else since you're not asking me the right question. <laughs> what are the big global trends for the next 10, 15 years, and how they're going to impact India? Because remember, we are part of a global economy. The barriers to trade and movement of people is coming down. The barriers to movement of capital is coming down. So if the Americans raise interest rates, we are going to be hurt. We can't stay unique like we were 20, 30 years ago. All right? So if you look at the world today, global GDP is $106 trillion. United States is 26, Europe 17 to 20, depending upon uh, the currency. And uh, the OECD may be 60% of that, emerging markets 40% led by China, which is $20, uh, $20 trillion. And the OECD will grow maybe 2 2.5%. 2 the emerging markets will grow 4.5%. World will grow 3 3.5%. .5%. So clearly, in this decade, you're going to see the shift of global GDP growth from the OECD to the emerging markets. But the, emerge, but the OECD still has all the accumulated savings of humankind huge amount of saving. They have the capital. Capital is not here, but uh, economy is growing and uh, labor uh, things are going, many things are going, right? So the next 20 years, you're going to see more capital flow to these countries because if they're not growing, uh, surplus capital has to find a way. Uh, before uh, the last one year, after COVID, $25 trillion of bonds were quoting at zero or negative rates, right, Saurabh? Because they printed those kind of things from 2008 till uh, COVID, post-COVID, all right? Now, this is the global situation. What are the big global trends which are going to impact humanity? In my mind, the biggest trend is aging and popular demographics. Today, the United Nations had said, I mean, a few, uh, two, three years back, that the population of 8 billion will go up to 11 billion by 2100. Now, people are saying it will be 9.6 billion. If you look at the world today, China's population of 1.45 billion is shrinking in absolute numbers. They're just not producing enough babies and more people are aging. So China's population 1.42 could shrink to maybe 1.2 by 2050 and maybe 800, 900 million by 2100. We never imagined that, right? Japanese population of 122 million is shrinking. Last year, they produced 800,000 babies, 1.6 million Japanese died, 35% of Japanese above age of 65. And sadly, more than 30% of young people below the age of 35 have never interacted with the opposite gender. If you don't interact with the opposite gender, how do you make babies? <laughs> so there's a problem, and there's a social problem, and the Japanese population of 122 million is expected to shrink to 96 million by 2050 and 67 million by 2100. The fertility rate in Korea has come down dramatically. So China... Japan, Korea has come down. Southeast Asia, fertility rate is 1.5, 1.6, coming down. Russia's population is shrinking. The men are drinking more vodka and dying. And Scandinavia population is shrinking. Median age in Europe is 47 plus years. 
In Japan, too, it is 47 years. In the United States, uh, fertility has come down, and I think by 2045, the Hispanics will make up the largest part of the population. In India, fertility has come to 2.0 two years back. In the entire South, fertility is about 1.5 to 1.7. Karnataka is 1.6. Tamil Nadu is 1.7. And if you look at Tamil Nadu's projections of uh, population, by 2035, there'll be more people dying than babies being born. Kerala is also aging and shrinking. And Bengal is 1.5, 1.6. The Punjab is 1.5, 1.6 because they want to go out. And if you look at communities, the Jains are at 1.2. If at least 1.2, you're not going to survive 50 years. So you better get all the money from the Jains, the clients. <laughs> and the Sikhs are 1.5. Maybe because the men are going away, running away to Canada, whatever it is. So fertility and population growth is the most critical thing in my view rather than climate change, which is important. Now, I know it's controversial, because everybody say climate change, climate change, climate change, there's a lot of money in it, right? But if people, population does not grow, people become older, a larger part of the population becomes older, what happens to society? In Germany, there are two young people to pay the pension for one older person. In the entire West, it will be less. The young people run away because they got pensions paid on, earn, I mean, pay as you earn basis, right? There's no fund. So there's a problem there. And this is a very big structural problem. And this structural problem does, cannot be solved unless you have more babies being born. And that's not happening anytime good. And I think that is a big, big change that's happening. Aging society. India today has 130 million people after 1.242 billion above the age of 60. By 2020, it will be about 200 million people. How are you going to take care of them? 200 million, 20 crore people above the age of 60. They're all been born, they're living, and they're going to grow old. Now, that is a big structural problem. We have to spend money on uh, elderly people for medical care, and people are living longer. In Japan, uh, women live up to 86, men up to 85. India, men, I think, live up to maybe, I think, 60, 67, and women to 69, something like that. Women live longer, so don't ever oppress women. They'll have the last laugh on everybody. Women live longer <laughs> all around the world, all around the world. It is the strength of the human that is there. So this kind of demographic change we are not understood because for the last 100 years, we've seen population grow up, more mouths, more labor, more hands, growth, growth, etc. Now, when the population grows more slowly and they age much faster and the changes happen, what do we do? Now, that is a big change. The second thing that is happening in a very big way is automation. Saurabh, we are in the midst of the digital revolution today. The, in 1750, the Industrial Revolution took place with the invention of the steam engine in Great Britain, and that led to the domination of Europe over Asia and the world for the next maybe 200 years, because they started creating factories, and they used steam for, uh, for fuel to run those machines, and machines ran, produced goods, they ran 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, and there could be better production, cheaper production, and standardized production, then they use their wealth to go to the colonies like India and other places, took away the raw material, manufacture, they dumped the goods here. They cut the thumbs of all those Muslim weavers in Bengal, right? They destroyed the Indian economy, looted $45 trillion from India uh, from 9, 1757 to 1947 or something like that, right? So you've seen all this happening, and that created the global supply chain. The global supply chain to reach consumers is a product of the industrial revolution. The global supply chain to shipping, through pipelines, to retail, wholesale, financial services, transportation, to connect producers to consumers. If producers are there, how do you reach consumers? If we produce, how do you sell to the West? And they opened up globalization. So this supply chain made the West very rich because they control it. 15 years back, the internet came. On the internet, everybody's on the same platform. Out of 8 billion people today, 5.5 billion have a mobile phone, 5.3 billion have, are on the internet, and about 4.75 billion have, are on social media. That means everybody on the internet, you get the network impact. So on the internet, you can get education, you can get financial services, you can get information, you can get health services, you can do business, you can do everything else. And for businesses, the most critical thing if you're in business reaching a consumer is there on the web today. And that is driving growth. And that growth is fantastic. So we are in the midst of the digital revolution where the speed of change is very high. I think it took 60 years for the airline to have one million uh, 1 million um, uh, you know, users. 
today Pokemon, I think, um, Pokemon took about 19 days, huh? 19 days, 5 million or 50 million? 50 million, huh? 50 million, 50 million users. Uh, airlines, uh, six, uh, 60 years. Pokemon took 90 days. Meta took two days. When they came with a new product, the speed of change is immense. Connectivity is immense. And this market is 24 into 7, which works synchronously, asynchronously. Synchronously means we both are in the same time zone, same time. Asynchronously means everything is there and you are there. Now, what does e-commerce do? E-commerce puts 10 lakhs, 20 lakh products on the product. So you can go choose everything and you can buy and pay and they deliver to you home. You don't require a physical shop, you don't bother about logistics, you can sell to anybody in New York, Timbuktu, or anywhere you want. But if you want a physical store, you need to have Reliance Geo here and Reliance Geo, you got to go here. Can they put 10 million, 10, 10 lakh goods? They can't. So this change in business is very important and we are 15 years there. So the next 10 years is going to see a tremendous change in B2C, B2B, etc. Along with robotics, along with artificial intelligence, 60% of what human beings do are going to be done by machines and robots, and software. And the trend is very clear. In the last 20 years, 15 million middle class jobs in America disappeared because of technology. Manufacturing has disappeared, services have disappeared. In banking, in the last 15 years in India, balance sheets have grown 10x. I think the employment has grown maybe 10, 15%. It's then the latest RBI report. It's unbelievable, the change. But India is still growing and we are able to do all that. So I think that is a big change. So the digital revolution is the change, and in that, United States is number one, China number two, India is number three, and Europe has become a digital colony. They just can't get their act together, they just don't understand, and they don't have innovation. The only big company is SAP, they have a few startups in Berlin and Paris which are doing some small things, but that is it. So the digital revolution is going to change society unbelievably, and India is at the heart of it. We have the software industry, 200 billion, which go to 500 billion by 2030. Will it happen? Yeah, the odds are in our favor. Startups, 100,000 startups, 21,000 funded, creating $550 billion of value, 109 unicorns. And we got $140 billion of capital coming in from 2014 till June of 2023. At the same time, China got about 832 billion, America 2.34 trillion. So we lack capital in this country. Because you know, you're doing, buying some, you know, whatever you buy in your marketplace, you're not investing there. And this uh, number, 100,000, will go to 200,000 by 2025. Pranav gets 700 startups coming to him every month for capital in Bangalore. You don't see it here, you see it in Bangalore. And we believe this 109 unicorns will become 250 unicorns by 2026, and this 550 billion will become 1.5 trillion. So we're in the midst of the digital revolution, and digitization is creating great stuff. Of the 10 most valuable companies in the world, eight are digital. Uh, one is, um, you know, Saudi Aramco, and other is Berkshire. Uh, but Saudi Aramco is a country with oil, right? But the biggest profits are there. Apple makes $100 billion of profit. Nvidia made $6.5 billion in one quarter. Before that, they're making some 600 million. One quarter, 600 billion. So look at the change that's happening there. And the next big change that is happening is the shift of economic power from the OECD to the emerging markets. In the next 20 years, because the savings will shift, growth will shift, etc., and that is going to be a seminal uh, change. Okay? And, then, and the last point that will happen is uh, in, uh, in technology itself, the uh, rise of AI, artificial intelligence, large learning models coming up, uh, humanoids coming up, and all that as part of the digital revolution. Digital revolution is the way we interact, and here is all about the technology inputs that are coming up, and that is going to change. And that will have very deep impact in a society which we need to understand. Now, you ask about jobs. You see, there are two kinds of jobs, formal and informal. Uh, people calculate jobs based on the age group of maybe uh, 15 to 65. Today, we have 265 million young children in school up to class 12 out of potential 300 million. So almost every kid is in school. There are more girls in school than otherwise. Our gross enrollment rate in college is 27. That means we got about 4.32 crore young people in college. We graduate one crore a year. But only 27% of young people, 18, 23, go to college. And the 28 and the 18, 23 group is shrinking every year. It's coming down. In India, it uh, only grew in the last 10 years by 0.2%. In Karnataka, it was negative 0.5% over the last 10 years. CAGR, all right? So we are seeing this trend of young people in college. So you take the working age group, 
45% of Indians work in agriculture. Agriculture made up 16% of GDP, but 45%, the rest work in industry and services. I think industry is about maybe 22-23% uh, and balance is in services. All right. So there are formal jobs and informal jobs. Formal jobs are those that pay ESIPF. If you look at the ESIPF data, last year we had 1.58 crore young people, I mean people paying social security contribution by check, uh, check at least once, 1.58. Out of 2.5 crore babies born 20 years ago, at least they'll all grow up to 21. They were born 20 years ago, they grow up to 21. Out of 2.5, maybe uh, 1 crore will go into agriculture, or get married and not want a job. 1.5 crore, 1.6 crore want jobs. So we are producing the kind of jobs, uh, 1.5 crore ESI and PF, and that is happening. Out of which 52% uh, is the age group of 18 to 25, so it will be the first job. But 70% of jobs are less than 25,000 rupees a month, and that is the problem. That we don't have enough good jobs, so people shift from work to work, they don't want to work, or they do something, and I think we're creating a large number of jobs. That's why Subramaniam from LNT said, I got 35,000 vacancies, I don't have people. So one side, people say an unemployment, but they don't understand, they don't look at data, and uh, all these guys in Delhi say, we grew from 2 trillion in 2014 to 3.75 trillion this year without producing jobs. Come on, give me a break. We produce jobs, huge amount of jobs. So jobs are being produced, but jobs are produced less. And I'll give you another instance of jobs. We sell about eight to 900,000 LCBs, HCBs, MCBs, out of which maybe 25, 30% are replacement. So 600, 6 lakh LCBs, they get two jobs each. That's 12 lakh jobs. We sell about um, 4.2 million cars. That is 500,000 required drivers. 500,000, so because there'll be taxis or drivers, so that'll be another five lakhs. We sell nine lakh tractors. Each fellow will drive a tractor, it may not be a job. So 20 lakh people are getting employed every year incrementally from the auto industry. We got 1.2 crore trucks in the road. They're all being driven, right? That's why the roads are crowded. So you look at all this, jobs are being created. It's not the quality of jobs. It is, I mean, not the quantum of jobs, the quality of jobs that are being created. That is a problem in this country today. So I think jobs are being created. So, so let me just try to uh, pull together the themes MDP has given. But whilst I do that, folks, if you want to uh, put your uh, few questions to MDP, feel free to put them in the queue cards and just send them up front, promote will post them to MDP. We've got another half an hour to make the most of, of this formidable intellect uh, that, that MDP has. So, so I'll just try to piece together what he's saying. So, so step one, this entire boom around, around IT services, as all of you know, is fundamentally, Bangalore was the kind of home ground of it. It spread over to Hyderabad, it spread over to Pune. Uh, what we're also seeing is the entire China plus one theme is fundamentally around uh, uh, three big clusters, the Bangalore Hosur cluster, uh, Hyderabad uh, and Telangana generally, and then on to the area around Chennai. There's some action also in the Surat, Vapi, Baroda belt. Right now, what this is doing is it's make it's creating an economic boom of unprecedented proportions in South India. We discussed it this morning. Seven southern states accounting for 47 percent of GDP, less than a third of population. I suspect when the next census is done, it'll account for less than a third of population and almost half of GDP. Right? Our job, therefore, is to is to focus on that area and see how much how much we can invest in companies which are optimizing, optimizing on that part of the country. I'll give the themes, basis what MDP is teaching us, and then we'll get on to some other investments. Secondly, women. MDP just said more girls than boys in school. This is true across from KG to class 12. KG to class 12, more girls than boys. Pass rates for girls much higher. Pass rates for girls are much higher. And as a result, the girls who are coming into the labor force are much more employable in good factories. Say, I was in the Volvo Aisha factory yesterday. A Volvo Aisha factory wants women in senior positions, right? If you go to uh, the, the Pune area, the Pimpri area, they want girls as foremen, women as foremen, because women are, are, are more skilled, they speak better English, so on and so forth. So the second boom we are seeing is women being in jobs. Bank accounts now have uh, a typical bank account with a woman as the, the name on the account will have significantly more money than a bank account with a man. Right? So yesterday in Indore, the number I heard was 2.5x. It blew my mind. Women have 2.5x as much money in the bank, in the countryside around Indore, than men. 
The typical pan-India number seems to be around 14-15%. In typical cities, women have 15% more money. Now, join the themes. We want to play South India. We also want to play the rising affluence of women. The fact that they hold now increasingly the economic power. So, in Hyderabad, we, we did a six months of research and we found this hospital company called Rainbow Hospitals, right? 17 hospitals, primarily in South India. They're also opening up in Pune. Uh, primarily in South India, focused on maternity and pediatric care. 45% uh, return on capital, one of the most, I think the most uh, profitable large hospital chain. I'm sure in due course, others will also enter. But pediatric, maternity uh, uh, and gynac care, Super specialty chain, 17 hospitals focused on the most affluent part of the country, the part of the country where women are most likely to go to work. Right? You can see how they are joining the dots, right? In a nuclear family, the kind of age-old wisdom of the grandmother is no longer there to help with childbirth, to help with the raising of the child. And therefore, the more nuclear the family is, the more affluent the woman is, the more she's willing to pay for a childbirth. What do you think is the typical child delivery cost? If you want to, uh, if you want your bachcha to be born in Rainbow Hospitals, what's the typical billing rate? Anybody wants to volunteer? Two lakhs, Hanji. Two lakhs, right? So North India may go to a corresponding hospital. North India is more like 20, 40 thousand. In South India, it's close to two lakhs, right? Uh, Mind-blowing number. So that's the first way to think about this, right? Folk take multiple themes, find the intersection. Rainbow is one example. Second is Zudio from Trent. Trentka West Side is more kind of our strata of society. Zudio is focused on people who have slightly lower income, right? Say people are buying 400, 500 rupees ka t-shirt, right? Now Zudio has focus. Zudio is the uh, Trentka budget kind of economy offering, but a Zudio store doesn't look economy. Zudio store looks very nice, just that the clothes are 300, 400, 500, 600 rupees, but technology is central there because the way they make money is they refresh the store. Uh, Zara ka model leke, they refresh this, so they use technology to figure out that in, uh, uh, in Vijaywada today, what will kids want to wear, youngsters, 18 to 25 year old kids in Vijaywada, uh, uh, what jeans, what t-shirts and that whole inventory will be not be there next week. So week to week, the inventory will churn. As a result, although the ticket size is small, the churn, inventory churn is 15 times faster than any other apparel retailer in the country. Right? So again, Zudioka expansion primarily has been South India centric. I think now, now they are pushing a little bit into the north, but primarily South India centric, smart people, the trend Tata people, they realize that there's a market for youngsters who want to look good. No, no youngster no, wants to buy budget clothing with the clothes piled high. They figured out using Zara ka knowledge, they have a JV with Zara. They figured out how to push the clothes through the store faster, market it using digital media, using Insta. So the youngster will feel, Ki boss, I, I just saw this t-shirt on Insta, now I can find it in my neighborhood store in Guntur or Vijaywada and the clothes are flying off the shelf, right? So that's another intersection. Let's take one more theme, right? Uh, uh, MDP talked about quality jobs, right? So he's absolutely right. HDFC bank profit compounding 20%, but uh, uh, in the last 10 years, job growth in HDFC bank, headcount growth would be barely 3-4%. Bhargav Das Gupta told you this morning, that they've compounded profits over 10 years at 20%. Their employment today is the same as it was 10 years ago. He said, right, his headcount today, this is India's premium, preeminent pre pre general insurer. Right now, what this is doing is, it's creating a class of very affluent executives. If, if ICICI Lombard, profits have grown at 21% over 10 years, but the headcount hasn't grown, that means the people who work there are earning serious money, right? Combine that with the rise of venture capital, PE funded companies, combine that with the rise of regional elites and you have the rise of roughly 1 million super rich individuals working in high paid executive jobs, working in private equity VC funded companies and working in regional giants. These 1 million people now want to spend on uh, uh, luxury consumption. Right? Not just invest in PMS. I wish they put all their money in PMS, but they also want to live a life. They're buying nice cars, they're buying nice clothes. But this one million people, for the first time in Indian history, the cohort of a million odd, if you're really optimistic, two million odd, who can uh, invest in venture capital, uh, uh, private equity, Marcellus type operations, plus they can go and buy expensive goods at a rate which have never been seen before in the country, which is why you're seeing the luxury retailers beat a path through India. Now, again, going back, what do we want to do? We want to make money from the strata. 
should we therefore invest in hero moto or uh, royal enfield right royal enfield right class now becomes for the first time in indian history class becomes the main driver of consumption rather than mass so so far it historically been a mass focused consumption country right you buy tel sabun and you buy a little bit more and you do well but now we have got a, a cohort of super rich people who can drive class based consumption at a rapid rate right and again this this type of orientation of the portfolio is what what you will see uh, coming through in the coming months this is also why we launched global compounders because a lot of people in this 1 million strong super rich are saying i also want to invest in in microsoft and apple and nvidia and asml and that's why the marcellus global compounders portfolio was set up a year ago in gift city pramod over to you S sir you, you know, touched i want to tell you one fact look at the sale of cars i think those maruti 800 is not selling anymore the suvs suvs are selling more and more i think the 10 lakh 30 lakh cars are selling more and more i don't know how they travel in bombay or bangalore because they you know the traffic doesn't move but i guess they say when i'm traveling i want a very comfortable place to sit down i'm spending more time in traveling i guess they're doing that right yeah absolutely now i'll uh, give you a hack this will cost you as nestle shareholders some money but as a consumer you will benefit and this is a hack you will find very beneficial with lots of companies so what mdp just gave you is an example of how how smart companies are making money right now this is happening in almost every strata so if you go home you'll check this out it blows my mind if you buy nestle ka wo chhota chhota coffee ka you know the sachet right the per cup cost is lower with the sachet than if you buy the glass jar normally you would think ulta no you think well, buy the glass jar sasta hoga you know there you know only one glass jar no but they know that you will buy the glass jar and the say security guard outside will buy the sachet so they're going to game you by making the per cup cost higher uh, 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 with the glass jar than with the sachet so so i learned this sitting at home in, in the evening my wife makes me do the amazon shop, shopping so i used to initially go for the bigger one right then i realized boss chhota kharido because the chhota is priced for a different economic strata of society i'm happy to go low if it gets me cheap so i only have sachet ka coffee it saves me money every day but for the nestle shareholders perspective we should keep buying the glass jar <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know shaura if you look at indigo last quarter 3000 crore profit what did they do they didn't cut the price they brought down the utilization right they said we are dumb why should we fill up this silly aircraft full of people and you know push them round treat them like cattle when you can charge them more and fill up 85% make more money because they finally understood the objective of business is to make obscene amounts of money <laughs> the object of business is not social action improving society is to make obscene amounts of money yeah. then you distribute the money and people do what they want right 3000 crores now air, airline fares are going to go up any hotel today is 11 12 13 000 crores in a five star which is 9000 crores i mean 9000 rupees right and and i think you know saurabh my feeling is is happen after covid yeah. what happened during covid we all stayed home we are locked down the people were scared they're going to die then the third mera bank balance kitna hai kono paisa kharch karega they were all scared they couldn't do anything now after covid they save the spending money theek hai kharch karo let's have a good time why stay in crappy hotels grow in crappy cars eat crappy food eat the best you got you got enough money and for most people the extra spending is 15 20% and then of course they're making more money in the stock market by going hopefully to saurabh and making more money so spend that money right but the thing that 100 million people the consumption patterns have changed i don't you got to get data to prove this whether the habits have changed for people with money than the spending more because the fear of mortality mortality was never there for most people now that covid has created the fear what is going to happen because you don't know what is going to happen right yeah. earlier you had to get old and you know you said i'll live long and all that now we don't know and think about this your globally i think is happening yeah globally premiumization is happening in a very big way and i think this the reason is this maybe this okay so i mean there's a question uh, for which i wanted to give the context first uh, two days ago um, i had the good fortune of attending uh, the venture capital fund run by siddharth and pranav who are here um, and and uh, mdp referred to them uh, and he's right we don't hear some of the stuff that's happening in bangalore here in bombay um it it was a fascinating 
three hours that we got to see some of the stuff their companies were doing. Historically, venture capital investing was associated with taking something from the physical economy and converting into the digital economy. That itself is, is a big deal and, and, and progress, but um, it's not just about getting food delivery or converting uh, physical education into ed tech. Some of the stuff that some of those com companies were making, including the fastest uh, battery charging technology uh, is born in Bombay, uh, in Bangalore. And um, I think Unbox, another company, has had the most productive robotic uh, solution for, uh, for factories across the world. So the question this gentleman, uh, Bhavin Trivedi, is asking is, uh, while we are all proud of the Indian IT services story, uh, when will India grow up to producing the next NVIDIA in the world? Um, no, uh, I must tell you this. Um, in 2011 February, I was in Jaipur addressing an investors conference of Merrill Lynch. So I answered all the questions and said, I want to bid you goodbye and thank you very much. Then none of them understood what it was because I was stepping down from Infosys in 2011 in April. One guy said, Mohan, you what you talk about? I said, what you Then I told them, you asked me the same question you've been asking me since 1994. At least improve your questions. <laughs> okay. Now, why am I saying this? The same question, why is India not producing a Microsoft, Google, Giggle, and why are you all, you know, uh, cyber coolies, labor, all the left ask you. Let me first explain. Microsoft, Oracle, Meta, Apple, and Salesforce.com. Where are these companies? Where? Silicon Valley. America. America, yeah. What are the GDP? 26 trillion. How much do they spend on digital? Two trillion dollars a year. How much capital do they have? Unlimited savings. What about Europe? Are there any big digital companies? Only SAP in Germany. Japan, $5 trillion, $4.5 trillion economy, Nintendo, very small. Why is it not happening there? Because you need this ecosystem. We are a small economy, $3.5 trillion. Mera Bharat Mahan is clear, very clear. We have to pump ourselves up, we must grow. But compared to America, we are peanuts. I think we are uh, uh, maybe a little bit more than California. So we are a, you need a large economy with a lot of capital, a lot of purchase to create those giant companies. And it's not going to happen in India. But what we have done in exporting $200 billion of software, more than the oil exported by Saudi Arabia, is unbeatable. No country has done that. Let's be proud of that. We have these questions you ask, where is the capital? I told you, $140 billion of capital into startup with the third largest in the world. China, $832 billion. How much is Bombay investing in startup? Anda. Nobody. Out of 140 billion, only 10% is Indian capital. Saurabh, after India opened up in 91, the software service industry comes, Indians are still invested. The telecom industry come because of geo, Indians are still invested. The pharma industry grew, the selling is in, in, invested. Infrastructure industry grew, all the cronies got in, the foreigners come and take over the land, fine, you sell all your buildings to them and make your money, it is fine. They'll stay here. Okay, then the startup industry comes, 90% is owned by foreign capital apart from the founders. We are not investing, so we have to bring Bombay and Bangalore together. The money and capital and savings of Bombay and the technology of Bangalore. And let me give you some data about Bangalore. Bangalore population 1.2 billion, GDP could be anywhere between 150 to 180 billion dollars, Karnataka is 320 billion dollars. Our per capita income could be 14 to 16 thousand dollars per head. Out of 1.2 billion, there are 1.1 billion, 1, 1, uh, 1 point, I'm sorry, 12 million, 11 million vehicles, 25 lakh cars, 65 lakh two-wheelers. Bangalore has been selling 15 million square feet of gray day office space every year for 15 years, the largest in the world. And income has been going up. Out of 1 point, out of 12, I mean 1.2, I mean 1.2 crore people, 24 lakh people work in technology. 24 lakh people. Every year we hire 2 lakh people in technology, 2 to 2.5 lakh people in technology. There are 45 unicorns. Bangalore exports $80 billion of software services. Bangalore got $70 billion of capital into startups from 2014 to 2023. Um, you know, uh, and Bangalore is closer to Silicon Valley than Delhi. We go to Delhi, we feel very strange because they talk a very different language. Now, Bombay and Bangalore have to come together and we've got to find the means because innovation and technology is happening here and they're all growing up to be big companies. Now, you ask some 10 companies coming to, for listing, 
they all spoil the market because they priced too high, they thought the cock of the walk, we are going to change the world. It takes a little bit of time to change the world with somebody's money, but when we put money, we want value, right? Now the price came down, Paytm came down from came down by 75-80%, now it's gone up a little bit, but there is growth. You're seeing change. And once they all change and they grow up, you're going to find value being created. The problem with the valuation, because they thought, you know, we should be a multiple of sales, multiple of this, it is there because the world was booming at that point of time. And now we got to see this. And that is the change that you're going to see. So when you become a $5 trillion, $10 trillion economy, we're going to see this change. But you know, we got to be very careful what we ask. Yeah, no, I, w I was fascinated uh, at that event. So I, I, I thought that I saw a lot of promise. Uh, so I totally no, agree no, There with is you. a lot of promise. Huge amount of promise, but they have to scale up, and I think they're scaling up very nicely. It takes time to scale up, but I think they're doing it very nicely. But we need capital. You see, in uh, 22, we got 25 billion. 21, we got 42 billion. In 20, we got 12 billion. This year, we got 6 billion for six months. End of the year, we could be getting maybe 10, 11 billion. If you, if you keep pumping 20, 25 million, we'll see it grow faster. So you, you've been uh, involved with education through your role at uh, Manipal Education as well. So few people have asked the same question around the quality of the education generally in India, uh, particularly for the bottom of the pyramid. How can we, uh, how can the private sector play a role or is there a role for the private sector? It's the government's responsibility. How do you see bringing that Pramod, up? Pramod, we got to be real, man. We got 4.2 crore young people in college. 1,200 universities, 56,000 colleges, 16 lakh faculty. No country in the world ever in human history has created a high quality education for such numbers. America has got about 16 lakh, 1.6 million, I think, uh, no, 16 million people, 16 million. And barring the top 25, 30% Americans, they are all crappy. The third rate community college is all kind of crap. Today, Americans have got $1.6 trillion of student debt, largest amount for media studies, women's studies, work studies, and all kind of stuff there, which has got no real value in the real business. They're unemployable, they got student debt. Now, we've got to understand it's not going to happen. Even Germany has got top 25, 30%, but Germany has got a fantastic skill-based education system, so they'll suffer, they will do well, but it'll not happen, okay? So we've got to be very careful. China has got 35 million young people in college, and the numbers are stagnating now. They're, they're, their, uh, this thing is maybe 45-50% gross enrollment rate and India will go up from uh, 4.2 to maybe 7 at the rate we are growing because we are growing at 3.6% a year in enrollment. So when you talk about quality, the top 20% are pretty good, employable, the next 20% can be trained and the rest are just okay. Please understand, uh, Amatya Sen was asked a question about uh, bad schools in India. What are going to bad schools? He made a statement, bad schools are better than no schools. The four years you send in college are the four years you get a worldview, you socialize, you meet people, you learn to negotiate, you grow up and find out yourself as a good place. There's no way we're going to give quality education. A, a, a guy in IIT costs you five lakhs a year. Medical, they're charging 25 lakhs a year for medical college seats in the private sector. It's absurd. It's totally absurd, but that's the cost. Maybe 20% you reduce, that 80% is the cost. You subsidize balance 50 percent. So when you talk about quality of education, it's a process. Quality is going to come because at home, your parents educated, they teach you something. You go to a school where you get a reasonable education, and then you go to a college where reasonable standards are there. If everybody is going to be the top 20 percent, it's not going to happen. So we got a reasonable expectation. That's when the new education policy, we got three layers of institution. One are the pure research-based institution where richer is the focus. They're going to have master's, PhDs in the brightest kid, that may be 5%. Next is going to be teaching come research, that may be 25, 30%. And bad balance are going to be community colleges where you get a BA, BSc, whatever it is, some nice thing you get, you learn some few skills and others. But that's what is going to happen. And you're not going to change this in the next 15, 20 years. Right. It's just a scale problem that cannot be solved, uh, you know, easily. Not overnight, easily, even for the next 30, 40 years. Wow. Um, so now, we look at the other side. In fact, few people have written the same question. Um, what can go wrong in the India story? What is the risk? Well, a lot that of things can go wrong. The world could explode. <laughs> we could have a world war. We could have nuclear fights. Correct? Uh, Pakistan could blow up and they could all run away. I hope they don't come here. Whatever it is, we've got to close the borders, right? They're in a mess. And um, the digital revolution, uh, you know, automation can take over in a very big way. 
uh, the political situation in India could go bad because right now the trend is to give away somebody's money easily to come to power. In Karnataka, 55, 60,000 crore subsidies are going out. They're not spending money on roads. They stopped everything and the new rate card has come up in Karnataka. So we're going to see much increased corruption than we ever did. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things can go wrong. But look, let us understand one thing. The sun is going to rise in the morning and set in the evening. Whether you are there or not, it's going to happen. So do you want to be pessimistic and moan about the past and the future? Or are you going to be optimistic and change the future? So you decide. Phenomenal. <laughs> So this is a question from Arindam. Um, he's saying historically there have been other countries which showed promise and hit a middle income trap. And one of the most common reasons has been rising inequality in wealth and income. How do we as a country avoid that? Because these days uh, when we're sit looking at company results, we're clearly seeing a K-shaped recovery where you know, affluent products uh, are doing well in terms of numbers, but uh, products catering to the bottom of the pyramid are still sort of uh, stagnating. Uh, is that a real risk? Well, you know, uh, for a large complex country like India, that is going to be the real challenge. Now, when you talk about e equality, we got to distinguish between wealth and income. Hmm. When you talk about wealth, most of the rich people in the world have wealth in stocks. Elon Musk is what, 200 billion? The next day the stock tanks 30%. He becomes poor, man. He lost 60 billion. <laughs> He's become very poor. And Oxfam write those silly reports based on top 1%, all based on market value. You can't sell the damn stocks because sell them, the markets will crash and everything will come down. So you've got to have some real value. And of course, people have some property, blah, blah, blah. The question is, what is the income differential? I read that Piketty's article and said, you know, the big and all India. There is one person who had 500 crores income that year. He's taken that 500 crores of the top income and bottom and said inequality is very high. I think what we got to do is we got to cut off the top 10% and leave them aside, then compare. And you find that inequality is much lesser than what it was. Mm. But the key thing is very simple in this country. As a society, we have to make sure that no Indian suffers from deprivation. We all have the basic necessities of life. For that, we have to subsidize. We have to give them houses. We have to do all the things which Modi has been doing in a fantastic way. Second thing is, we have to invest in uh, infrastructure and capital to make uh, India more productive. Now, there are only two things that can make an economy productive. Productivity of capital, productivity of labor. Productivity of capital is a function of markets because the markets give more capital to people who are more productive in capital. Am I right? The value becomes higher and that market mechanism is working fairly well in India. But productivity of uh, people, productivity of people requires skill development, requires higher education, requires automation, requires tool, is, a going, is an ongoing process uh, which will happen, right? And that's the only way. So we have to invest in human capital, we have to invest in health, we've got to do this. There's limited resources we've got to muddle through. And the next thing that we've got to do is we have to make sure that more and more jobs are being created. Like I said, 1.5 crore people uh, you know, paid social security contribution the first time last year, 52% age group of 80, 18 to 25, those are all first time jobs. Jobs are being created. So in inequality will always be there. And you know, we can never create an egalitarian society except in the dreams of the leftists who believe that they have the intellectual ability to distribute everybody's money without creating wealth. And you know what happened to the Soviet Union, right? So inequality will be there. How do you create a social structure where People who are below poverty get the necessary life, keep body and soul together. There also is a delicate balance. Uh, I think about 45% uh, of the world's social security spending goes in Europe, with 25% of the population of the you know, world or something like that. So there's a problem about spending. And democracy implies uh, that uh, politicians will want to buy votes and give many things. So, that'll, so that, that process is there. But I think the key is, you know, I'm, I'm doing an interesting experiment now. There are eight crore taxpayers in India. Three crores pay a little bit of tax. Why can't those three crore people adopt one poor family each and pay 5,000 rupees a month to the woman of the house just as a grant for five years? We can solve poverty by adopting a family. Why can't we educate one child from a poor family? Now the time has come for Indians who have become prosperous to apart from paying taxes and all the nice stuff that you do, to take direct action. 
If you have people working for you, drivers and you know, host mates and things, pay for the children's education and do that. I'm sure most of you are doing that. And that's the way you get social action. Remember in England, when people came off the land after the merchant class grew up after 1500, the largest source of employment in the UK was uh, the people who worked at people's homes in London, right? They're the largest sector of the agriculture, right? And that's how they got a place, they got education, they got a thing. So we've got to have social action being done in a big way. But inequality will remain. And uh, democracy is the best way to settle that because democracy is a system of competitive lobbies. Everybody's got a lobby. We've got a farmer lobby, we've got a caste lobby, we've got a religious lobby, all lobbies. And we need politicians to give something to everybody to keep the hope, hope going. Is there going to be anybody with a magic wand who's going to solve problem, remove inequality anywhere in the world, anytime in human civilization? No. So I guess we have time for one last question. Again, something of your domain involvement in healthcare. Uh, Again, healthcare availability to the bottom of the pyramid, uh, there's still a big gap. Uh, what do you think are the prospects for the same? See, with that 500 million people that Modi wants to give health insurance will solve a lot of the problem. Now, healthcare has got three components, right? One is primary care, where you need to go to a primary care center, and that we have to improve. And one of the best ways to improve is to work with those uh, medical colleges. We've got 650 medical colleges. In the medical colleges, you teach what is called community medicine. Community medicine means you go meet uh, people and diagnose them and see what is happening for the small, small diseases and infections that they have. For example, South Kendra district has got better human development indices in health than America. Why? Because there are some, uh, you know, there's some uh, 40, I mean, 20, 20, 25 medical colleges there, and they use community medicine in a big way. So that we have to expand, and that public sector has to do it, because private sector can do it, it's going to be expensive. Then we need to have a chain of hospital which take care of normal hospitalization, uh, maybe birth delivery or some infection or some small operation, some, some things like that, which I think is growing. We have one bed for 1,700 people. We need one bed for 1,000. Uh, we've got 800,000 doctors, 105,000 MBBS seats are there, 65,000 MD seats are there. We almost doubled in capacity in the last 10 years. We need to produce 150,000 doctors a year so we can export them out too, because young people want to become doctors and we can do that. So I think that, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to do. Then we need tertiary hospital, which are top class, which I think it has to be public and private sector. We got some 20 aims now. Maybe we need 100 aims everywhere. We got a large number of private hospitals which are coming up. We got an affluent class, but they have to be supported by public expenditure for primary health and by insurance. Now the free insurance scheme of 50 crore people I think is very good. About four crore people have their operations done. Because RBI data says 40% of people who shift into poverty shift uh, because of uh, medical care. And that has to be stopped. And out-of-pocket expenditure of medical care in India has come down because of public sector spending. So are we going to have good health? Yes. See, for good health, we need clean water. We have this uh, water scheme, which will hopefully change the matter. We need toilets. Almost every house has got a toilet, mm. all right? And we need access to health. We need good nutrition. 80 crore people get food. I think the nutrition standard has gone up tremendously in this country. We got to get the latest data. So a lot of things are happening, and that will show up in long liberty. If you look at long liberty in the south versus long liberty in Bihar, the change is very, uh, very stark. And I, I would urge you and anybody who is interested in this, not to look at India as one country. Mm. You see, Bihar, UP is 23 crore people. Per capita income is 90,000 rupees. And uh, Bihar is 11, 12 crore people. Per capita income is 60,000 rupees, right? Bihar, Bengal is another 9 crore people. Per capita income is 1 lakh 40. In the, in the south, Karnataka is 3,83,000 this year, Tamil Nadu is 3,20,000, Telangana will be 3,60,000, and you know, Kerala will be maybe 2 and a half, 3 lakhs, right? If you look at the south as a whole, per capita income is maybe 2x, 3x what these big states have. But uh, Bihar and uh, UP uh, make up maybe 25% of India's population, they drag you down. So you look at various states and find out what has worked, then you get a much better idea of what needs to be done. We cannot have one single Indian policy. We need policies for uh, each of these states. So I think healthcare is similar. In the south, it's fairly well done. Kerala is very good. I mean, Kerala is very good. The public sector works very well. Tamil Nadu has got capacity. Karnataka has got capacity. Maharashtra, large parts have got capacity. Telangana is doing well. Andhra is a little bit better. But what will it do with uh, West Bengal, rural, and Bihar and that? So I think with that uh, difficult just, sort of Just question. one last question, Gopal Mandanya wants to ask. 
Uh, how do you remember so much data? Is there a secret? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I work for a terrible person. In the exuberance of youth in 1994, I told Narayan Murthy that I'll give him a P&L account with 99.5% accuracy at 3 o'clock on the last working day. I was being foolish and young. So I did it till I stepped down in 2006 as CFO. And at 3.15, he was waiting, he waits for me every month end. And 3.15, if I don't call up, he'll call me and say, are you sleeping? Where are my numbers? So I got to give it to him, one. Then every year I used to meet 300 investors. I mean, analysts and investors. The only way I could do is to give them data and talk to them. And I had to understand what they're going to ask. And before they open their mouth, give the answer. <laughs> and three, I had to prove to them I knew more data than anybody. So I remembered all that and I, I could do it. And I found data is the best way to put a viewpoint across. Now, I was, I was just telling on, on social media, I was telling you about that guy who said, somebody, you know, Sadhanand Dume, another fellow who needs to have the data, and said, India has got the largest number of internet shutdowns. Compared to Ukraine, which is 22, India has got 84, out of which Kashmir happens to be 49. And uh, India is 1.42 billion people, and there are 30 million, 35 million. You're comparing a small country. People compare Singapore with India. Singapore should be compared with Bangalore. And then you come out with numbers. Delhi is the rape capital of the world. India is the largest number. It's all kind of rubbish because you've got to look at a uh, million people. And I get very upset, so I give data to counter all that. So data has been my passion and energy because through data you can explain many phenomena that happens. And data, you understand what is happening and gives you an insight. Fascinating. I was just so… Uh, so MDP's role as the CFO of Infosys is also a landmark, uh, uh, marked one of the landmark events for the country. It puts corporate, it put co corporate India at the global scene. Infosys was the first listed company on NASDAQ and still remains one of the biggest success stories. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.